Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Lisa Harker. I'm director of the Nuffield Family Justice Observatory. Welcome to this webinar in which we're going to be focusing on the experiences of parents with learning disabilities or difficulties who are involved in care proceedings with their babies. Nuffield Family Justice Observatory has today published a report on this subject based on research carried out by the Institute of Public Care at Oxford Brookes University. We'll shortly see a presentation from Professor Katie Birch. She's Assistant Director at the Institute of Public Care and was the lead researcher on this project. And she's going to outline the key research findings and the recommendations. Following Katie's presentation, we're going to hear from parents with learning disabilities who've been subject to care proceedings with their babies. And we'll also hear from a range of professionals who support parents in these circumstances. In addition, several other professionals will take part in a live panel discussion. We'll be joined by Professor Katie Birch, but also Barrister Reagan Persaud, Nadine Tilbury from the Working Together with Parents Network. That's a network that supports professionals working with parents with learning disabilities and learning difficulties and their children. And we're going to be joined by retired circuit judge and designated family judge, her, on, her honour, Hilary Watson. We've already received lots of questions in advance of today's event for our panel. Thank you to everyone who sent a question in. Um, but we still want to hear from you during the course of the event. So during the event, please take the opportunity to ask further questions or share your thoughts and reflections in the chat term. We'll try and address as many questions and comments as we can, but all of the comments will be read by the Nassau Family Justice Observatory team, and this helps us to shape future research and events. We can follow up on specific questions or feedback after the event. Now, some of you might want to prefer to, to watch today's event without the distraction of chat. You can do so by disabling the uh, chat function you do that by unchecking show chat preview in the chat tab and keeping the chat window closed. And finally, we're recording uh, this webinar and some of the content will be available afterwards on the events section of our website. That's nuffieldfjo.org.uk and you'll find recordings from other events there too. So to start with, Professor Katie Birch will now tell us more about the research. I'm Katie Birch, and I'm a professor and assistant director at the Institute of Public Care, which is a research and development unit embedded in Oxford Brookes University. And I led the study. The research team was invited to explore two really important questions. So the first question was to do with the proportion of care proceedings that involve uh, involving babies where parents have learning disabilities or learning difficulties. And the second question was to do with um, what are parents' journeys into and through care proceedings like. The review of case files and court bundles that we undertook for the study really enabled us to explore in particular question one regarding the number and proportion of parents with learning disabilities or learning difficulties in care proceedings. The second question, which was to do with the experiences of parents with learning disabilities and learning difficulties through into and through care proceedings, we explored through all of these three aspects of the methodology, including, of course, the in-depth interviews with parents and professionals. And we thank you all very much for your contributions. Now, before I get into the findings, we just need to touch base with some definitions of learning disabilities and learning difficulties. Um, these definitions informed both our data capture and how we've presented our findings in the report. So you'll see from this slide that we started out with two 
Public Health England definitions that are frequently referenced, although of course there are many similar-ish definitions in circulation and in use within the sector. I very much want to draw your attention to Tarleton and Turney's definition of learning difficulties that was particularly helpful and applicable to this study. This definition recognises as an overall definition of learning difficulties people with moderate intellectual difficulties, sometimes described as borderline learning disabilities, who do not have a formal diagnosis, but who struggle with similar issues. Although some of the parents identified in our study did have a formal diagnosis of learning disabilities, many others were evidenced to be firmly within Tarleton and Turney's definition. There are many other things I might say about definitions, but I'll skip that bear trap and limit myself to a, a couple of further observations. Firstly, that these definitions tend to be innately deficit-based. And the other thing that we would notice and observe is that they're not very connected or connectable to parenting which is what we're mainly concerned about in child protection processes and care proceedings. In our study, it may not surprise you to learn that the evidence of parental learning disability or learning difficulties came mainly from the content of expert psychologists or forensic psychologists' reports, which were very frequently court-ordered. Within those reports, parents' learning disabilities or learning difficulties were outlined in a much more nuanced way. So, for example, the reports explored spe specific areas such as how parents processed um, information, um, both information that um, uh, uh, both oral information and written information. Uh, they explored a parent's memory, their reasoning, independent living skills, adaptability, their attention and concentration. And so then to our findings, what were they? Um, well, within our sample of the 200 recently concluded care proceedings involving babies across four local authority areas, we found that just over one third of cases involved at least one parent with learning disabilities or learning difficulties. There was some variation by local authority area that could be explained certainly to some extent by the published prevalence rates for adult learning disability across England. We also found that just under one third of all the mothers in the 200 case file sample had evidenced learning disabilities or learning difficulties. So in almost all cases where we found learning disabilities or learning difficulties overall. Are you surprised by this or does it confirm what you know or felt already? So I've referenced already how useful the expert uh, uh, psychology reports were this is where we found almost all our evidence relating to parental learning disabilities or learning difficulties. Because where these reports were directed by the, the courts, they invariably did identify parental learning disability or learning difficulties. This suggests that our one third finding may be quite a conservative figure. In the small number of cases where no parental learning disabilities or difficulties were identified, often the parent was identified as having psychological challenges. So what were the main characteristics of the families and parents in our one-third sample? You'll see from this slide that a very high proportion of these parents with learning disabilities or learning difficulties involved in care proceedings were referred to children's social care 
pre-birth, that is during the pregnancy. And where this was the case, I should say that this was mostly quite early in the pregnancy, so in the first or in the early second trimester. The mother's ages ranged from 15 to 41 years, but on average, these mothers were in their mid-twenties, so not all that young. Dads were on average a little older, but not by much. It was interesting to see, and it might not surprise you to learn that about one half of the mothers already had older children in care. About one half um, uh, had also themselves been care or social care experienced as children. You might not be surprised or shocked to learn these things, um, but this is clearly a very vulnerable group. So, the most significant theme from our findings regarding parents and their therefore family experiences into children's social care, into and through care proceedings, was to do with timeliness and specifically to do with delay, which naturally affected pretty much everything post-referral. In about three quarters of the cases where we identified parental learning disabilities or learning difficulties, these D disabilities or difficulties had been identified at a very late stage, so during care proceedings. We thought this was really concerning because particularly where it involved a first child, that meant that everything that's important, like communications with a social worker, uh -huh. parenting and other types of assessment, the support services themselves could not be adapted as they should. The decision-making forums like child protection, conferences, PLO meetings could not be tailored with a risk that they might not be understood by the parents attending them. Um, or we felt that parents might easily misjudge their significance. A particularly pernicious aspect of delay related to the start of actual support where parents were referred during pregnancy where this support was delayed by weeks and sometimes even by months. This very frequently meant that the clock was ticking for parents who, because of their often multiple vulnerabilities, were already at significant risk of having their babies taken into care soon after the birth. Another significant theme was the um, inconsistent nature of good enough supports for parent engagement and participation, particularly at key times, such as the referral into children's social care or in the lead up to the birth of the child, um, or when things were potting up, as it were, into a PLO, um, or after the end of care proceedings, and um, particularly where the decision was that children should not remain living with their birth parents. The important supports, such as social worker communications, lay advocacy, family group conferencing, or similar uh, arrangements, support at the end of proceedings were very variable, both in terms of their availability and quality. Social work professionals identified a lack of training on work with parents with learning disabilities or learning difficulties, or sufficient time to put that training into practice as real barriers to uh, um, getting good parent engagement and participation. And this was a real concern. We looked also at the sufficiency of reasonable adjustments, which is a requirement under the Equality Act, so as not to put people with disabilities at substantial disadvantage. You will see that here again, despite some good examples dotted here and there, that there was overall lots that we found to improve upon, particularly during pre-proceedings. 
During the actual care proceedings themselves, we could see from case files and from the interviews that more was done to make these reasonable adjustments. Although it sometimes felt to the research team mm -hmm. as though this was a bit Rolls Royce at a time when adjustments would not realistically make a huge change to the outcome one way or another. It may or may not surprise you to learn that many social workers we talked with suggested that they did not even make a request for adult social care colleagues and services to become involved, even where they thought this would help them to make those reasonable adjustments. That because they considered the application of eligibility criteria to set the bar too high within their area. So what were the outcomes of care proceedings for the children of parents with learning disabilities or learning difficulties? You'll see from this slide that most of these children had a plan for adoption, 44%. Slightly fewer, 35%, had a plan to reside with an extended family member or members and Fewer again, 21% had a plan to remain living with the birth parents. I should add that there was an interesting range here across the different local authority areas. So, for example, as to the proportion of children with a plan to remain living with birth parents, it was from 18% to 35%. Or as to the range um, of children with a plan to live with extended family, the range was from 24% to 50%, or the range um, where uh, adoption was the plan from 25% to over 50%. We looked at the why make any change question and identified three areas or sets of compelling reasons. The first and foremost reason is a rights-based perspective or rationale, particularly thinking about the rights of parents to have systems and support um, where reasonable adjustments are made. But of course, this is really very highly predicated on professionals knowing about and acknowledging parents' learning disabilities or learning difficulties first. We secondly identify a practice improvement argument, which basically recognises how all services, generally speaking, require themselves to make ongoing improvements to services and practice based on emerging evidence. Why not here? This is an area that has in the past arguably been, been considered fairly niche, but really, as this study shows, it is not. Thirdly, we think there are significant whole systems benefits, including economic benefits, to be considered. Essentially, what we're saying here is that by making improvements, we anticipate that, for example, identifying parental learning disabilities or learning difficulties earlier may well reduce the likelihood for local authorities to have to pay for assessments more than once. So it, it essentially is eliminating the need for local authorities to repeat assessments, particularly during care proceedings when parental learning disabilities or learning difficulties are identified. Whilst we very much appreciate the pressures that local authorities are under, we're asking you to do five things. We're asking you to require social workers, your social workers, to screen for and we're indicated to organise a more in-depth assessment of parents' learning needs as a core part of the early assessment work, including pre-birth, of course. We're asking you to ensure that social workers do undertake regular and mandatory post-qualification training. We're asking that you think, consider incorporating and nurturing learning disabilities expertise into your child and family social work teams. We're asking you to end the practice of delaying support pre-birth as outlined in existing best practice guidelines. And finally, we're asking you to improve the commissioning 
of lay advocacy to ensure that it is available always when it is needed. We're asking leaders of the judiciary, the bar and solicitors, people working in care proceedings to improve the rollout of vulnerable witness training for all advocates who are working in care proceedings. We think you should consider developing specific training for the judiciary on directing proceedings that involve parents with learning disabilities. And with national partners, we'd ask you to consider whether and how um, some or all of the family drug and alcohol processes could be applied here in care proceedings involving parents with learning disabilities or learning difficulties to improve their experience and the effectiveness of support that's provided during proceedings, including at the end of those proceedings. And then finally, we're asking policymakers to do four things. Firstly, to improve the visibility of the existing good practice guidance on working with parents with learning disability, and also the best practice guidelines for when the state intervenes at birth. We're asking you to encourage more timely identification of parental learning disability or learning difficulty. You might do that through developing or road testing approaches to pre-proceeding screening uh, and identification, so through uh, testing tools, protocols and pathways there. We're asking you to explore with Social Work England whether social work qualification training does include enough emphasis on working with parents with learning disabilities or learning difficulties. And finally, we're asking you to consider providing funding or other incentives to local areas to pilot specific improvements that we've outlined here. Overall, although we're passing on our thoughts about what needs to happen next, um, uh, during this presentation and in our report, we'd really like to pass the baton over to the sector at this point. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts in a moment on what you think are the main implications of the study's findings. Thank you, Katie, for that overview of the research and your recommendations. Uh, if you'd like to read the report in full, you can see a link in the chat or you can visit our website, nuffieldfjo.org.uk. Please carry on posting your questions and reflections on the research findings and the recommendations in the chat. Now, of course, we're really grateful to the parents who took part in the research and thank them for sharing their experiences with the researchers. We'll now hear from them. They'll talk to us about how they felt about parenting assessments, the types of support they received or didn't receive, and their experiences of court. Their quotes have been voiced by actors to conceal their identities. You're scared to do anything. Scared to do anything wrong? It was like they've made up their minds ages ago, and that was it. It was good doing the assessment. I just didn't like some of the attitudes. It's not really support. You have weekly key working, but you mainly just fill out a form and tick a sheet. It's not the right support. I have support now, but there's nothing for dads. Radio silence. You take my kids and then you just disappear. I just want to say, for people in my situation with learning needs, the government should help with the funding of therapy. Lots of meetings. It really wasn't help and supporting me. I know it's about the baby, but it should be about the baby and me. I hated it, I just sat there in a daze, I couldn't stop crying. It was hard. We were there four days in a row. They speak jargon. I had not a clue what anyone was saying. It was like a constant thing where I had to ask my solicitor, what are they saying? We had our lawyers, but they had to deal with a court case 
They aren't there to talk to us personally. A fidget loved her with my emotions, so she brought lots of fidget things for me. She even set things up so that every 15 minutes we would have a five minute break. My solicitor is amazing. She understood me. She knew my past. She would ring me after court to see how I was. Just someone to talk to. They will let you cry, let you scream. And with someone like me, with learning needs, they help me with paperwork, reading stuff. They help me get comfort. If I didn't have them, I wouldn't be the person I am. I wouldn't be going to college. I would be locking myself in my room. I wouldn't go to doctors to get help with my depression. I feel positive in my life. Again, we thank those parents for participating in the research. The difference that appropriate support can make to parents with learning disabilities and their children has also been communicated in a film called Mother's Day, which was made by the British Institute for Human Rights. Um, we think it's great. We recommend it. Uh, you can find a link to it in the chat. Four professionals will now talk about the different types of support that parents might need. We'll hear from Hannah Taylor, a specialist social worker at the Comma Project, Jessica Hurst, a solicitor at Locking Solicitors, and Nicola Lewis, an intermediary. So my name is Hannah Taylor, and I work for a service called Comma at Stockport Family and Stockport Council. And um, we sit within children's services. Um, and we support parents who are at risk of repeat proceedings and repeat separation from their children. So in terms of care proceedings and challenges that parents with learning disabilities face, um, I think care proceedings present significant challenges for all parents and um, but particularly parents with brain disability. One of the main issues that we see is that parents often have undiagnosed and disabilities. So often they've been involved with children's services for a number of years, you know, they've been in child mood processes, child sexual processes, often in law outline, and um, there's been improvements and then things have fallen back. And um, there's often worries about parents' capacity to sustain change. Um, and when it comes into the court arena, I think often social workers rapidly aware of that parent who has a learning need. Well, because of the complexity of people, I think it 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 becomes very complicated in terms of you know these these particular parents have got often had a trauma history. So as children, they have um, experienced abuse themselves. Um, and because of that, they've had behaviours um, that have been put down to draw a lad rather than a learning need. Mm -hmm. So when they come into court, often what happens is that they'll get a cognitive assessment and a psychological assessment. And the cognitive assessment will identify that there is a learning need there, um, or a learning disability. And the psychological assessment will identify that there's a mental health need there. That the two have often gone mixed because they've been confused with each other. And so what happens is when we get into the proceedings we need that will be a diagnosis at that point. And at that point, the parent can then access things like um, an assessment of adult services if they have that diagnosis. But I proceed into one in six weeks. So at that point, by the time that specialist assessment's been completed, they have a diagnosis. They're left with this time time frame, um, which they then have to evidence significant change and an ability to sustain change. Um, and often where therapeutic support has been offered or um a need for specialist services around their learning disability, the parent doesn't have the time to evidence their um commitment to or sustained working with those services within that type of time frame care proceedings. It's just there that 
needs to happen so, so much earlier so that the parent has, you know, right back when it's first recognised that a parent has learned to still before it even enters the care proceedings. So that we can really understand, you know, what are, what is this parent's needs? How how do we assess them in a way that they can engage fully? And then we can make sure that they have the right services in place before to, to test whether that parent is able with the right support to care of their children safely. Um, but unfortunately, cognitive assessments show they're incredibly expensive. There's massive waiting lists at the moment for them, even for um, once parents are in care proceedings. Yeah. So they're, they're waiting for quite a long time for those assessments to come into fruition. And um, just because of the capacity of the psychologists, the way that the language is used and the formality of public law proceedings can be really intimidating for all parents. But for parents with learning disabilities, they can struggle significantly to understand what's actually happening in. Also, learn it, people with learning disabilities often need independent advocacy. And again, that was an outcome, um, a best practice outcome, and um, it came from 2021 guidance where they can together with parents network. Um, that is really difficult to get at. And I think often the solicitor is seen as an independent advocate, of course. But in terms of really advocating with social care, that can be really difficult. A lot of legal um, aid solicitors are incredibly uh, busy. You know, they have lots and lots of cases all the time. Um, parents are learning disabilities often need information repeated into them continually. And solicitors don't always have the capacity to be able to do that. So in terms of the specific support that we offer to parents who learn disabilities during care proceedings, uh, we attend court with them, we help take notes for them, we talk to them afterwards about what happened, what decisions were, um, any recommendations that were made in terms of what they need to do at the end of the proceedings, we'll repeat that to them. We have the time that parents will continue ring with us and ask us to repeat that information, which we will. Um, if there has been assessments around the learning needs that have outlined um, how that information should be communicated to them, we would follow that advice to make sure that the parent has the best possible um, opportunity to, to understand what's taken place. The experience of women who have children in the youth isn't really fully understood. And um, you left to say parents who learn disabilities who, you know, would understand um, those experiences differently and often don't fully understand why, why those decisions have been made. Um, so it's, it's important for services to hold parents emotionally. I think, you know, that's the ethical responsibility of these parents in such pain. And I think what parents report is that they need to be seen, they need that pain to be felt by other people as you recognise, and that it shouldn't be ashamed that just because their child is somewhere else and say that there isn't an experience of grief in loss for those parents because there truly is. So I'm Jessica, um, I'm a family lawyer um, based in a firm of solicitors in um, East Yorkshire and I predominantly represent parents um, within public law proceedings. I find that parents with learning difficulties or disabilities can struggle to understand and follow the court proceedings and process. Um, they tend to struggle to read court papers and can be easily overwhelmed with the amount of appointments, court hearings and contacts. Um, and when presented with new documents, um, they can find that difficult as well. I try to manage a parent's expectations before going into court and talk them through in a very simple way what is likely to be discussed or happen in a hearing. 
I have in some cases shown them around the courtroom before a hearing has started to prepare a parent. So if I find that a parent is not following a hearing or appears overwhelmed, then I do ask for a break um, from the judge so that I can step out for a few moments with a parent and double check that they're okay and whether they've got any queries that they want to put to me um, and then hope that it's um, that they find it able to then rejoin the hearing. I use simple layman's terms wherever possible with a parent. However, the use of an advocate or an intermediary can greatly assist with this as well and ensure that a parent can participate within the proceedings. There is some legal aid available for parents pre-proceedings, particularly if the local authorities commenced the public law outline process. This enables parents to seek legal advice and assistance and they're able to ask questions. However, the funding is limited and any additional support such as an advocate is dependent upon the local authority funding such support. And so again, that can be limited as well. I haven't experienced the use of intermediaries during pre-proceedings in our area, but have experienced the use of intermediaries during public law proceedings. Their availability tends to be good as long as they're booked in advance and then an assessment has taken place in good time. There has certainly been an increase in the use of intermediaries. However, there's been recent case law which may now affect the use of intermediaries within family proceedings and the availability of that resource being able to be accessed um, and may now lead to a reduction in that use, which is unfortunate. There is a real lack of local advocate services within our area and often there's a real delay in an advocate being appointed to a case, if at all. The funding for an intermediary within proceedings is very limited and tends to just be available by the court fund for assistance within hearings only and the legal aid agency do not tend to fund the use of intermediaries for conferences away from hearings which can make it difficult when needing to hold legal conferences and meetings with them away from the court environment. I would say it's important to try to recognise early on if there's any cognitive difficulties or capacity issues with a parent and seek a cognitive assessment as early as possible. This can be crucial as it assists and guides all professionals, including yourself as their legal representative, upon how to support a parent and help them participate within proceedings. It leads to necessary support and avoids delay in the triggering of this support as well and it being accessed for the parent. It is really about trying to build a network and a package of support around a parent which tends to lead to a more positive outcome for a parent. For instance, a parent may enter supported housing which enables access to day-to-day -day support for them. But alongside that access um, to local resources and support is also important, such as from children's centres or family. It's about identifying what support may be available to an individual parent and identifying when a local care assessment, for instance, is needed for a parent which then leads and triggers more support for a parent. My name is Nicola Lewis. I'm an intermediary and I've been doing that job for approximately 10 years now. Essentially, we help people with communication impairments to understand what's going on in the justice process that they're involved in and also to be understood. So it's about being able to understand the process in court. It's being able to understand their solicitors and their barristers to be able to give instructions 
and also to be able to express themselves, so to be able to give their evidence uh, in court. So understanding is a massive difficulty and also when vulnerable people give their evidence, um, there's also the ability of the justice professionals to tailor their communication to the needs of the vulnerable person. So I think it was Baroness Hale who said that it's for justice professionals, it's for the justice system to adapt to vulnerable people, not the other way around. What I would say is that masking is a very common phenomenon in the family courts for people with learning disabilities. They will build their understanding of a word around the words that they do understand and filling gaps. And that can lead to people acting as if they understand a question when they've got no idea. They're just propping up their understanding by linking into words that they do know, but potentially completely misunderstanding the word that they don't. And sometimes people with learning disabilities can have issues with focus and concentration. And what that means is they won't be able to sit from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. with a very large cognitive overload of information coming towards them visually, verbally, in documents. And they may need breaks and they may need shorter court days. The other really fundamental point is trauma. Trauma naturally um, is going to play a part where parents are going to be asked to talk about things in their past or talk about events which have occurred uh, concerning their children. And quite often they will be placed back in the moment in court. And those who understand trauma and trauma-informed practice understand that that leads to certain parts of the brain and certain parts of communication to go offline. Some parts of memory retrieval go offline. Some parts of functional communication can go offline. And without a fundamental understanding of those issues, parents with learning disabilities can be severely disadvantaged in court when giving their evidence and when trying to understand the process before them. There is a real issue that intermediaries or communication support to the level required is just not available pre-proceedings. That pre-proceedings, quite often, there's a breakdown in communication between the parent with the learning disability and the team that's trying to get them back on track and trying to, even just to get across to them, the importance of taking steps at that point before the matter escalates and goes to court. And it seems a very easy win from our perspective to have the right level of communication support. Interventions that could usefully have happened earlier on in the proceedings with the right level of understanding as to what they are, why they are being recommended, and what the consequences are, if that information could be delivered in the pre-proceedings um, time, then from my perspective, far fewer cases would end up where they do. I've been doing the job for 10 years. I've only ever been invited once to assist pre-proceedings. So what do I actually do as an intermediary? I will help the parent to understand the court documentation. Uh, sometimes that will be with solicitors in meetings in advance of the court hearing. Quite often, it will be at the start of each court day. We will review the evidence that's going to be presented, um, sometimes to refresh their memories as to what the issues are, uh, who the various individuals are. We might look at what their roles are and understanding basically what's going on. So understanding court documentation, understanding the potential outcomes and their effect on the parent. And again, um, concepts like parental responsibility, PR, I would say maybe in 10% of the cases I've worked with with parents with learning disabilities, have they actually understood what parental responsibility is and what it means? So we will work very hard to explain what the potential outcomes are and their effect 
on the parents' parental responsibility and their ability to continue seeing their children in a short, medium, longer term. Then back in court, we will help the vulnerable person to understand the evidence being presented live in court in the moment, quite often literally simplifying in real time what's going on. Also, in court, an intermediary will assist the vulnerable person to give their evidence. This often breaks down into two parts, really. One is we can assist the lawyers uh, in tempering their uh, questions so that it meets the communication needs of the vulnerable person. Again, all, all tailored to the vulnerability of that specific person. There is no generic person with a learning disability. There are people with strengths and weaknesses. We also assist the vulnerable person to instruct their lawyer. So there are conferences obviously outside the physical courtroom, which are often as important as what goes on in the courtroom itself. A lot of the negotiations and discussions need to be explained. And the person with the learning disability needs to be able to tell their lawyer what they want to happen. Finally, there's judgment. It's obviously key that the person with learning disabilities is able to understand that the decision that the judge has made. And often we will recommend that the judge gives their decision first and then all the reasons follow. Again, quite often people with learning disabilities may have um, problems with retention. And the last thing you want is for somebody to have been so overwhelmed in the moment that they leave court and then they can't actually remember the reasons why their children were removed from their care. For me, from my perspective, a positive outcome is effective participation and equal access, fair access to justice. To my mind, a positive outcome for a parent is being able to take part in a process, being able to understand what the reasons are that there are worries and concerns, being able to understand what needs to happen for you to be able to keep your child in your care and being able to understand what the decision is our thanks go to those four professionals for explaining parents' challenges from different perspectives and telling us about their roles and the support services they offer. So I'd now like to invite Professor Katie Birch, Reagan Persaud, Nadine Tilbury, and her honour, Hilary Watson, to join us for a panel discussion. I think I've had a message to say Nadine is having a few technical difficulties, so her camera isn't working, but we'll still be able to... Hira, welcome to all of you and thank you for joining. Um, I hope and I know that members of uh, our audience are going to keep posting their questions in the chat tub. It's been um, really lively so far. I've seen lots of comments and questions coming in. So I'm going to try and fire lots of questions at the panel. Um, let's start with what should be happening and what the statutory guidance says. Um, the research we're discussing today was undertaken in England. So um, I can see in the in the chat, there's been some discussion about uh, guidance in Wales too. But Nadine, can I ask you, because your organisation was involved and uh, responsible for drawing up the good practice guidelines. So could you explain what parents should be expecting? What should they receive? And and why is it that we're, we're still not seeing that in practice? Well, um, first of all, Lisa, you mentioned statutory guidance. That is a big bugbear because the good practice guidance on working with um, parents with a learning disability is not statutory guidance. It was created in 2007 by the then government departments. And then subsequently, of course, uh, policy changes, law changes, and he needed to be updated from 2007. It was based on um, Beth Tarleton's research at the time, 2006, finding the right support. It was referred to by Dylan um, J. Uh, Northern Ireland case, which is very important. So the good practice guidance had a really solid foundation of evidence in 2007. It needed to be updated, but for some reason, the government departments were very reluctant to do it. That's the Department for Education and the Department of Health. Um, we've had prolonged emails with them, but at the moment, they're still um, not wanting to take back control of their document. 
So the Working Together Parents Network updated it in 2016, and we updated it again in 2021. And the presidents of the family division, two of them have said, it's, you know, it's not rocket science, use it, it's there, we commend it. Um, we've got Court of Appeal, we've got the High Court, we've got loads of courts saying, use it. it. And it, it isn't rocket science. It's a very basic explanation of how best to work with parents with learning disabilities. The Scottish um, system had their own good practice guidance in 2015, and the Welsh good practice guidance has come on board in 2023 with some excellent leadership from the Welsh government on that one. Um, determined to reduce the number of children going into care um, from parents with learning disabilities. Excellent guidance. But then the gist is that the if you did apply the principles of the good practice guidance, you would be complying pretty much with all the human rights there are. The United Nations Conventions, the Human Rights Act, the Equality Act, all the whole caboodle of rights for the children as well as the parents would be um, respected if the principles were followed. And there are five main factors, and it's about accessible information, it's about support of independent advocates, it's about referral procedures. I can only um, commend the guidance to all the people attending this webinar. Those of you who are not familiar with it, have a quick browse through your bath time reading, but it's got the basics for respecting the human rights of the families. Thanks, Nadine. Now, look, one of one of the main themes that's come out of all the presentations today is about timeliness or the lack of timeliness, the late identification of learning difficulties and disabilities. And maybe I could ask you, Katie, first to comment on this because, um, you know, you pointed out in your presentation so many, for so many parents, three quarters of them, the, the uh, learning disability wasn't picked up until very late in proceedings. So why is it that assessments are not happening at an earlier stage? What do you think is going on? I think there's a lot that's going on and, and the people who um, gave us very generously of their time to participate in an interview for this study pretty much all noted and agreed that a big barrier is resources. Um, the fact is that uh, getting an in, a more in-depth assessment, the cognitive assessment of something similar, um, when that's done within court proceedings, the costs are shared, generally speaking, across the parties. But if it's done earlier, then it's the local authority alone that's but shouldering the, the, the burden, the financial burden of getting that done. That seemed to be a really big barrier. But beyond that, people also talked about the fact that Social workers didn't have enough time. They didn't have enough experience or training to even sometimes alert them to this as something to explore in more depth, if you like, to screen a bit for learning disabilities or learning difficulties, to explore how, you know, what, is, what, what, what that meant um, in practice. So, so those are, uh, we thought, two really major barriers here and that, so it's not surprising that um, those are things that we've commented upon in terms of our recommendations but how how to get that earlier screening and understanding of a parent's communication needs more than anything else um, uh, you know how to get that done is, is, is difficult I think in this current environment. And just I'm going to ask Reagan in a minute whether this you know chimes with your experience too but but Casey, just one one comment on the dads in the process, because the, the 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 again the research focused very much on mum's experience. You did mention that some dads also had learning disabilities and difficulties, but where are they in the in the whole process? Are they involved in support uh, access to support too? I mean, in our sample, which I would guess is pretty representative in the mo for the most part, the it was mums who were either the sole parent carer um, or uh, dads were having, you know, quite uh, a limited involvement. Um, however, there were some cases where dads were more involved or indeed where the dad, very small number, where the dad was the um, primary carer, um, dads with 
learning difficulties, learning disabilities, as well as mums. In some cases, you'll see from our report. Um, I think the reality is that that most of the focus is on mothers, um, but most of the support services that are available in local authorities now do work with dads as well as mums, and they're in, you know the profile of them, the need for that work is 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 definitely being raised. There, there there aren't the barriers to that that perhaps they were uh, you know ten years or so ago, but we can improve there as well, of course, in terms of the support that's available. Thank you, Reagan. I want to come to you. I mean, as a barrister, this this issue about timeliness, you must be seeing cases where learning disability and difficulty hasn't yet been identified and uh, uh, the, you know the, the, the delay and the, the assessment and the support to the family what do you think is going on and what can you as lawyers try to do about that thanks Lisa I think that there are many cases sadly where these issues don't get identified soon enough and I, and I think there's a lot that could be done before the matter even gets to court um, to try and reduce some of the issues and identified. I think we have to remember, linking back to masking and the point made, um, a lot of parents with learning difficulties and disabilities, these haven't just popped up when they, the mothers become pregnant or um, the, the child's on the way. These are issues that these parents have felt their entire life, which often means that they have suffered themselves bullying in childhood, abuse in childhood, and they remain vulnerable. It means as adults, they do mask. It means as adults, they're not exactly willing to volunteer and say, I have difficulties and I need people to adjust to me. We as professionals have to adjust to them. And that makes it makes the job harder, I think, for professionals to identify it. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't. More could be done earlier on to try and tackle these issues. In many of our cases, what we see is pre-birth assessments being done um, before the matters will enter into court. And what is identifying them they work with? But in fact, I think there's more that could be done along these lines. I think firstly, social workers should be more alive to the good practice guidance in working with parents with learning disabilities. Because having that knowledge and having that guidance, which continues to be endorsed as good law, we had the case of Reage from the Court of Appeal last year that endorsed it as good law now. It would help them to identify these issues sooner. If it's on the radar, if it's something they're looking for. Once identified, we have an opportunity before a child is born to do a lot of work with parents. Now, I appreciate bathing a child, learning how to feed a child might be difficult without a baby actually there. But what about things like making sure you understand how to keep a tidy home when a baby will be here? What about things like learning to make healthy meals before a baby is here? You don't need a child to learn those skills. Those are things that can be taught pre-proceedings. And if they are taught pre-proceedings, it means that when that child is there, one of the issues we've, we've already seen spoken about today, parents feeling overwhelmed with appointments, or we would have reduced some of the appointments that they need to attend. We would have made the week more manageable when they will be learning the necessary skills. So coming back to the question you asked me, I think we can front load this with support. We can look at creative solutions and what can be done before a baby is there and make sure that the social workers are alive to that, thinking about that, and are equipped to manage that by looking at the good practice guidance early. Thank you. Um, some great reflections there. Um, I want to come to Judge Watson. So a lot of these cases are coming to court. It's only during proceedings when parents' needs are being identified. I wonder about the role of judges here and what they can be doing to really encourage early identification themselves through the actions that they can take. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the timeliness is it is the issue, the subject. I think what would be helpful would be if the uh, social workers in their initial statements actually set out how they have been able to communicate with the parents, what difficulties they have found, uh, how they have uh, adapted their processes to deal with those difficulties. In other words, alerting everybody from the outset that there, there may be some difficulties here. Um, I think I would probably want to know why there hadn't been a cognitive assessment earlier uh, and really expect an answer to that. And uh, if it is because of the difficulties with funding, then I think um, the judges do have the ability to say, well, the local authority will be funding this assessment on, uh, on its own, um, notwithstanding that we're within proceedings. In other words, it isn't going to make a difference. Potentially. Well, uh, thank you. 
on the topic of assessments, perhaps I could come back to Nadine to ask you a bit about that. I can see in the in the chat there's been some questions about some of the assessments that are currently being used. Uh, briefly, can you just explain uh, what, in addition to sort of uh, psychologist assessments, what kind of assessments could be used at an earlier stage? What we should be looking out for in terms of assessments and how they're being used? And timeliness, again, the timeliness is absolutely in all aspects of these cases. <clears throat> as far as assessments are concerned, you want an early and timely appropriate assessment. And as somebody's already said, um, we've got things like um, occupational therapists assessments, we've got SALT speech and language therapist assessments, as well as the cognitive ones, as well as the parenting capacity ones. If we look at the parenting ones, there are probably three well-known specialist um, assessments. One is PAMS, one is Parent Assess, and one is QBAS. And I've seen in the chat some mention of Parent Assess. Um, Parent Assess, for example, run free webinars for lawyers or legal people who are interested in court proceedings. Um, really, really informative of how the assessment is done. Uh, people have got their views about the pros and cons of PAMS. Um, but I think the essential point is that whoever is using or reading the assessment, whether it's the judge or whether it's a other professional somewhere in the group, they have to understand how that assessment, that specialist assessment was designed to work. Because anybody who says, oh, this is PAMS based or it's parent assess based is not in fact referring to a, a, a proper PAMS or a proper parent assess. So if you don't understand how the assessment framework was designed to work, then you don't know what, how to evaluate the report that you are reading. So I, I absolutely would it's thoroughly endorse everybody. Um, if you are using PAMS, then you should have a look at the instruction pamphlet um, have like roughly 90 pages on the instruction booklet for how to carry out a PAMS. You should look at the cartoons used. You should look at the questions used. You should look at the marking used so that you understand what the PAMS evaluation actually means and what it's based on. Same with Parent Assess. Go to their webinars, have a look at their materials, understand it. Um, so I, I, that's what I would really say about the assessments. Given the, the, the judgment, the final judgment is so heavily based on the assessments, the nature of the assessment, the professionalism of the assessment, the timing of the assessment are crucial. Thank you. Right. I want to come to another question that's come up in the chat. Um, and this is about some of the recent judgments that relate um, to intermediaries. I mean, these are judgments from Mrs. Uh, Justice Leaven and uh, Mr. Justice Williams. And um, in short, they effectively raised the bar in terms of the use of intermediary support. I wondered, Hilary, what your thoughts were on this, given what we've discussed in, in today's webinar about the importance of that role at particular points in the process. Um, well, I, I would say right at the outset that I've always found intermediaries to be extremely helpful in uh, assisting the court, assisting the judge in uh, managing the difficulties in, in, in these cases where you have a parent or sometimes two parents who have learning difficulties and just making us take stock as we go along with where we are, what's been understood, what hasn't been understood, uh, whether we're going too fast, whether we're going too slow, um, whether the court process is being understood. I, I have found them absolutely invaluable. Um, and therefore, um, what I would say to intermediaries is um, we as judges want you to assist us in the in the court proceedings. And the, uh, uh, the way that you can do that is to set out very clearly what it is as an intermediary that you can bring to the proceedings over and above the good practice that we've We've heard from several participants uh, in, in this webinar. Uh, absolutely um, essential to, to realise that the bar has been set a little higher, but to show why it is in this particular instance that it is uh, important that there should be an intermediary. Um, the, um, uh, can I just at this stage say that uh, there is the Advocates Gateway. There are 
toolkits in the advocates um, gateway for practitioners, criminal practitioners, but also family practitioners. And all practitioners will be using those toolkits, using those, uh, th those methods. So the intermediaries have to indicate why it is that that's not enough, that we do need to grab something much more tailored, much more spe specialist in this particular case. Thank you. Um, there have been lots of questions actually uh, before the webinar and during the webinar about asking for advice, about toolkits, about resources, about training. I've noticed a lot of uh, information being shared in the chat, so thank you for that. And um, we'll ask our panel to, to help us with any further links that we can share uh, after the, the webinar. One of the questions that's come up in the chat is about uh, neurodiversity. So. Uh, there's an increasing focus and debate around the courts at the moment about needing to respond to people who have autism or other neurodiverse conditions. Um, and the question really was about whether whether we're conflating uh, neurodiversity with learning disability or difficulties and how you avoid doing that and understand the differences. I wonder, Katie, if you could reflect in terms of the research, whether you mentioned in your presentation that there were some parents with, with both the learning disability and autism. Um, how was that being handled in practice in cases? Well, I think um, really how it's been handled is in the early stages is that um, sometimes parents may describe their condition, if you like, to social workers as uh, a neurodiverse condition. So they may say, I'm I have autism or something similar. And if you like, sometimes that's taken on face value. So there isn't a further exploration of whether that parent has additional learning disabilities as well as autism. It, that won't necessarily be the case in all, in many circumstances, but I think the question perhaps isn't being asked. So we saw multiple instances of that happening where, um, a parent was described themselves or perhaps were, were referred by a midwife or health visitor who, who made a statement to that to the effect that they had autism. And then um, lo and behold, in court proceedings, many months later, it was discovered that they had, you know, really quite a low IQ and overall and certainly diagnosable learning disabilities. So there's an issue there, I think. I do think there's some confusion for people. A number of people have made uh, statements to me that, that um, uh, to the effect that uh, uh, autism is a learning disability, when in fact, if we look at, uh, at uh, the definitions that are used, that's not the case. It, this, you know, um, I think I think there is some confusion. I think we all need a bit more training. <laughs> And immersion into this world. And why? Well, because our study shows that this is not a niche area of practice, whether it's for social workers or for lawyers or judges. This is something that's going to be happening very regularly that we're working with people with um, parents with learning disabilities and learning difficulties. So we, you know, we really need to get a much better handle on this. And one of the things your research highlighted um, was the surprisingly few number of parents who have been referred to adult um, social care support, yeah. uh, the thresholds uh, being uh, high f for that. Um, I mean, again, is is that an area that needs to be explored? And um, and perhaps I could ask um, also Nadine to to reflect on that because I know there's new research coming on this on this topic. But first of all, Casey, what do you think about the relationship between children's social care and adult social care uh, to, to meet the needs of, of, of parents? Well, in this instance, it's quite a difficult relationship. I don't think that's the case, you know, always um, between children and services and adult services. But in this instance, it is difficult. And we found numerous instances of social workers, you said, that they just they just never did make a referral to their adult social care services partners because they kind of knew that their parent wouldn't meet 
the requirements within the local authority, their threshold, if you like, for getting involved and providing advice to the social worker, um, as well as potentially ongoing support to the parent. Um, where that support was provided, it seemed to be really useful to some parents, not only within the child protection processes and court proceedings, but 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 potentially beyond that point. I think there was just some concern about seeing this as a silver bullet because um, really what most parents want is to, once they've been through a period of having children's social care involvement, they usually say, well, don't really, you know, not sure about ongoing social worker involvement. What they really need and want is community-based support that is non-stigmatizing. And for most parents, they're not making the fine distinction that professionals are between a children's social worker and an adult social worker. It's just another social worker. Mm. So I think we need to be a bit careful about seeing access to adult social care services as a, as a silver bullet. Also, because as we know, going back to my earlier point, local authorities are really strapped for money. So we shouldn't be surprised uh, that, you know, the, you know, thresholds are quite high um, for these services. Um, it's quite difficult for adults with all sorts of difficulties to access adult social care. Um, and, you know, I like solutions or potential solutions that have got some potential to work. And I think it's the community-based support for me personally that 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 you know has has legs in um nadine i know this is a, a a topic that um your network has also been interested in exploring is there anything you wanted to add thank you um you know Tarleton, my colleague is just about to, to publish her piece of research on the relationship between children's um services and adult services um and everything katie says it is entirely endorsed by you know, um, best research, but I'd, I'd like to just say a couple of things. It's absolutely essential that children's services and adult services work together, because I don't really understand. I, I don't expect children's social worker to know or have an expertise about learning disability. Why would they? There's enough to learn, but I do expect them to be able to find a person who does. When you look at the embedded specialist project, uh, and we did a freedom of information inquiry on this. They will happily have an embedded specialist who is mental health or is substance abuse or is domestic abuse. But even when there's a family that they're working with who they have identified as having learning disabilities, they don't embed a learning disability specialist. No idea why. And they surprised themselves when they gave the answers for the FYI. Um, the second thing is, I love the fact of the CARE Act. It talks about an appearance of need. You don't need a, a diagnosis before you are eligible for an assessment. I hear what people say about the high threshold, but... The high threshold it isn't necessarily that high if you look at the fact that there's a significant impact on the person for not being able to do the, the couple of the eligible outcomes. It's very significant impact on the parent to think they're going to lose their child just because they can't keep a house properly safe for a child. Fine for an adult, but not properly safe for a child. So I, I, I struggle sometimes with this automatic thing of, oh, well, the threshold's very high. And then the next thing I would say is that there, there's a the big, I totally understand about services and austerity, but there's also the, a huge benefit of involving adult services is knowledge, advice. Yeah. That's a bit cheaper than I yeah. can provide service under Care Act. And, and it's that that I just think any ch child's social worker should be saying, let me find my colleague from across the corridor or the other building across the road who mm -hmm. knows about learning disability so that I can help the child properly by understanding how the mother and father are affected or impacted by their disability. And I think the last thing is, there is a statutory duty to cooperate between children's services and adult services. I mean, who knew? But there is, Section 6, Care Act, a statutory duty to cooperate. And it doesn't have to be dosh laden. Advice and information would be a good starter in terms of cooperation. Thanks, nice to um, just could I just add? Uh, yeah, put a plea, just put in a plea to please could social workers list what community um 
uh, services are available and um, in any assessment in any uh, statement to the court so that everybody knows what is available in the area so that they they can be directed to work thank you i mean i think some of what you're suggesting are things which don't cost huge sums of money this is partly about linking up what's there but also i think you've all uh, touched on the issue about needing to raise awareness understanding and skills across all of the professions we've talked about at today's webinar i'm really sorry that is all we have time for is flown by, but thank you very much to everyone who's contributed to today's webinar, including the parents and the professionals, and of course, our panelists. I wanted to say a special thank you to uh, Katie Birch and the team at the Institute of Public uh, Care at Oxford Brooks University for carrying out the research in the first place, and of course, uh, helping to disseminate the findings today. And thank you, everyone, to you all for attending and contributing I can see that the uh, the chat has been uh, busy today, so thank you for that. Again, if you'd like to find out more about the research um, that we've been uh, hearing about today, it can be downloaded from our website, nuffieldfgo.org.uk, and you'll see there's been a link in the chat. Please sign up to receive our, our regular bulletins, which contain information about our latest research and upcoming events, and you can do that at Nuffield fgo.org.uk forward slash subscribe. There's also going to be a link in the chat. Or if you're very modern, you can use your phone to scan the QR code that will be shown on the screen at the end of the event. Finally, we would be really grateful if you'd fill in our feedback form. It only takes uh, a few minutes and it helps us to design future events. So please, if you can, fill in that form. Thank you to you all. We look forward to welcoming you to future events. Thank you very much.